Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of your beauty and what you do. Raising dead things to life. Creating something beautiful out of dirt and dust. Thank you for having the power to breathe life into something and make it beautiful. For those of us that have said yes to you, Lord, you've done just that. Blew the breath of life into our dead bones. And now we enjoy life. The enemy did come to steal, kill, and destroy. But for those of us that have said yes to you, Jesus, we are enjoying life as that man did in the video. We can finally see what it is to live, not just to exist. But Lord, we're not satisfied with where we are. We want more. We want to experience more of this abundant life that you came to deliver. Your word tells us that it's this faith that we need. We need this faith in you. And you tell us that it's this faith that increases as we hear the word of God. And so, Lord, as you've given me the task to do that, I would just ask that you would help our hearts to be in a posture to receive your word and that you would bend our will to submission to the word of God. I know you give us free will, but would you bend us? Would you, would you press down upon our will now? And where we're stubborn, Lord, help us not to fight anymore. As your word would tell us, if today we hear you, do not harden your heart. And we don't want that, Lord. We don't want a hard heart. We want to hear the word and receive it with joy and live a life of abundance. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can sit down. Listen, guys, I don't know what's going on with that, that boom and bang. I don't know if it's lightning or what. I don't know what it is, but it is, that's what they say. Right? It is what it is. I don't even know what, where that came from, but it is what it is. That's like what people make up when they can't come up with something good. It is what it is. Everybody doing well? I'm glad you guys came to God's house to, to celebrate and, and, and worship the Lord. God's house, God's people, God's word, that's all good. It's a great, con that's the perfect storm. It's the perfect storm for something powerful to happen. And, uh, and I'm, I'm anticipating that it will if it hasn't already. Um, do me a favor and grab a copy of God's Word. That's what we do here. We study God's Word. And so put your eyes on God's Word. Don't just listen to what I have to say. That's not going to do you any good. Grab a Bible. They're all over the place in here. If you don't have one, grab one of these blue ones. They're, they're, they're on the tables. They're in the, they're in the pews. I still can't get used to saying that, man. The pews. Whew. Whew. So, so, so... Um, Grab a copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Philippians. We've been studying through Luke, and we're just going to take a break this week. Let me tell you why we're taking a break. So um, a couple weeks ago, I was sitting up here doing my thing, and, and, and a lady walks in, and, and you, most of you don't know her, but her name is, is Benita, and she is uh, Pastor Dixon of Life Without Limits. That's his wife, and she came in here, and... And she passed off a piece of paper to the sound booth, and the piece of paper, come to find out, was an invitation for, for, for us to come as a team and, uh, and come and celebrate their seventh anniversary. There's a church over in Eustis called Life Without Limits, and uh, Pastor Robert Dixon is the overseer there, great man of God. His wife is a wonderful lady. She loves the Lord Jesus with all her heart. She's passionate about the Lord, and she asked us to come and, and, and celebrate and kind of do their service last night. So last night, myself and my wife Meredith and, and the Revolution Band went to Life Without Limits and we had ourselves a good old time. We worshiped the Lord. We shared God's word. Man, it was just a great time. It was awesome. And so um, just blessed to be able to do that, just to kind of see churches come together 
and, and, and unify and just, you know, the Bible says, and I think it's in Romans 15, it says that we could come together with one voice and praise the Lord, you know, harmony. And so that's what happened last night. And so anyway, so in, in anticipation of that, I, I started to, to study and, and it was an anniversary. And so it's like, all right, Lord, so what do I need to, 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 to teach? Like, what, do, what, what is the word for them that night, you know? And, and I didn't know. And, and so I started to, 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 I was praying and I'm looking through the scriptures and I, I found what, what I needed to, to, to share with, with those people. And, and, at, and so my plan was this, because you know how my plans go, right? So my plan was this. I'm going to preach Philippians there, and then I'm going to continue on in Luke here. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 so as I'm studying this, I'm like, I didn't call God dude. But it, it kind of. I was like, hey, I think, wait, dude, this, like, our church needs to hear this too, you know? So, so here we are. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to share out of... Uh, Philippians chapter 3 uh, this evening, and so um, I hope it's a blessing to you. So we, we, we went to go celebrate this, this, this anniversary, and, and you know, I found out they're seven years in, and they're only about six months ahead of us, and so we're almost at that seven-year mark as well. And, and I guess, you know, someone said that seven's a special number to God, and, and I don't know all, a whole lot about that, but... But apparently it is, and so seven, the seventh year is going to be awesome, I'm sure. Uh, but what we were doing there is we were celebrating their seventh year. And so when you celebrate an anniversary, bless you, you, you celebrate the, the birth of something, like when it started. But not only that, but you start celebrating the events and the seasons along the way since its inception, you know. And so we look back and we kind of reflect on everything for life without limits, we were reflecting on things that were going on then. And I, I didn't really have much to talk about there about that because I'm not part of their church. Like, I wasn't there. Uh, but I've been here. And so what I want to do is just kind of talk about our church tonight, not Life Without Limits, but I want to talk about Revolution Church. And, and so it's good to look back and reflect on the, on the good and the bad that has happened here in our church. It's kind of a healthy thing to do for proper perspective, you know. We've got to have some perspective on things. And, and so um, I want to, you know, my perspective is quite a bit different than anyone else's in this room ex- with the exception of maybe Joseph and Mary here. I realized that, that when we started this church way back when, my, my wife and I were laying there last night talking about this and we started to scan the crowd of people and we realized that, that only Mary and Joseph and the two of us have been here since day one. This is all new. Awesome. And Mimi, that's, that's right, Mimi was there. I guess if there's no Mimi, there's no Meredith. <clears throat> so, but, but, but other than them, I, I have a, a I, don't, I hate to say pretty unique because there's no such thing. You're either unique or you're not, right? This is, unique is one of a kind. So, so I, I, but I have a pretty unique perspective on things that's a little bit different than your perspective. See, what happens is you walk into a place, like let's say this is your first time in here, and you walk in and you see a, 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 a built-out place with all this stuff and all these people, and there's teachers and equipment and, and signs, and, all the, and you're like, oh, this is kind of a cool place, and that's awesome. But, what, but, but you don't have the same perspective that I do as I walked in that door that day, and there was a big empty room. And, and I, so it's a little bit different for me. Like, I, I'm going way, way back. See, before seven years ago, there, I was still in ministry, and that's when we met. And, and, and so I was preaching in another church. And stuff. So I have a, a history that's a little bit different than you guys. I have a, a different perspective on, like, every single person that's ever walked in. See, you, you see who's in here right now. What I see is all the people that have been here, including you. Like, and so I'm thinking about all those people that have come through the church, too. All those people that have been baptized baptized and saved like I have a different perspective than than most and I see all the amazing provision that I touched on a minute ago when we we're doing our offering all the incredible provision that is provided for this place to be a reality I have that perspective and every, listen, I was over here oh a couple months ago on Monday nights we get together here and we pray and you should all come and and so I, I used to sit when we would pray. I would I would kind of lay over there on the floor. That's my spot. And I one day I was sitting there and we we're praying, you know. And and I just kind of looked. I usually sit here. I'm here, right? I'm never over there. But when I started to sit there, all of a sudden I saw the room from a different perspective. Same room, 
But all of a sudden, I started, as I'm sitting over there, I'm, I'm kind of scanning the room. And I looked, and I saw all this stuff. Now, this stuff doesn't have a whole lot of value, not like you guys, but, but it's amazing. See, my perspective is that when we first started this thing, we had, you know, seven or eight people, ten people, and we'd take an offering, and, 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 and Joseph's brother Randy would put the offering in a coffee can in his sock drawer in his trailer that he lived in in Umatilla. That was our offering. And if someone said, I needed some food, we'd just give him some money. That's how it started. So, so I, and I know where these tables came from, and I know where these chairs came from, and I know where these music stands and microphones and fan and bulbs and every cord that's in here. And I started going, wow, I can't believe this. Like, this is amazing. It's incredible, the perspective. So, and I see seasons of, of people praying like crazy and, and, and people giving. Like I said before, like giving in the moment is kind of difficult. But when you start to think about the people who gave over the years to provide for you so you could sit here right now to enjoy this experience right now, that's who you are for the people of tomorrow. But I, I, I've, seen, I've seen these miraculous Things that God has done to make this all a reality. And, and some of us have a perspective on painting. We've done some paint, uh, Michael, right? We've done some painting up in here. We're here in this building. Look, forget the first little building we have. We put a roof on that sucker. And, and I remember the day that, that I showed up with, with Kyle with sledgehammers to start smashing the, the beer coolers so we could build a church in a, in a convenience store and rip down the, the beer coolers and, and rip down the porno uh, magazine racks and pull them out and start a church. I was there for that. And then in here, yeah, you were there. And, and so, so, so you have a little bit different perspective. And so in this place, when this was empty and the walls were black and filled with holes because it was a putt-putt joint and kids would smash the walls with their golf clubs because that's what they do. And so we had to paint and, fr and fix and build and all. So some of us have that type of perspective too and building this place and cooking and all the dinners we've had and providing food for everyone and cleaning and, and preaching. How about... <clears throat> anyone, anyone go to college in here? Anyone, right? How many people enjoyed the, the research papers that you had to write? One. And she's totally lying because she went and put her hand down, right? No, you actually liked it? Are you really? Wow. That's good. I don't even know what to say. I dropped the mic, man. I had this whole big setup and you just crashed my party, man. <clears throat> it's not much fun though, right? I mean, there's one, I don't know if people are in here, but there's one person that likes to do that. You know, I preach about 45 weeks a year, if not more. And I preach about an hour, sometimes more. I preach one day, it was two hours and 21 minutes. That's not gonna happen today, but that was my favorite day. Just warning you, it could happen again at any time. Pack a lunch. <clears throat> but, but, but I have a different perspective. You know, like if you preach 45 weeks a year and you've been doing it seven years, you've preached 315 times. 315 times I've stood before you and shared God's word. It's a different perspective than most people would have. I remember days when we first got started, we were at the UMAC the Methodist Church in, in uh, Tavares. And I remember uh, days weren't, there wasn't always like this. There were days where before the service would start, I'd walk out, and most of you probably don't know this, but there was a, there's a little school there, and in between the youth building and the little nursery rooms, there was this little red bench. And I would go out to that bench, and my wife would have to come out there with me because I'd be either crying, literally, or Sorry, pissed. Hi, Facebook. <laughs> why don't you just tell, if you're on Facebook, why don't you start posting where you're at? I want to know where you're at because it says that all these people watch. I want to know where you are, so put down where you are. That'd be, that'd be really cool. Um, so I'd go out to that bench and I would cry, you know, because there's like no one's showing up. And that was discouraging. I know this is like spiritual. It's not like 
cutting grass, where you just cut it, like this is supposed to be spiritual, it's God doing it, I get all that, but when you pour your heart into something, you want it to work. I don't care who you are, right? So I had those days too where I would just be crying and sometimes I'd even be yelling at God or, you know, I had that perspective. When we were building this joint, um, we were building the bathrooms back there. Do you guys see this right here? You see that? That is the nail. That's the nail that, that, the, that the framer tried to bed into the wood and it ricocheted and went through my arm. And that, right in that little spot. And so that's all you saw. Like that, right up to the head. I got a different perspective than you guys. You know, I take this Jewish carpenter getting, taking the nails for his church, literally. And I did it. I didn't mean to. I wasn't happy about it at all. But I, huh. blood, sweat, and tears, man. I was, listen, though, I don't have the only, I don't have the only nail perspective because where's Andy? Where's Andy? That's the question all the time, isn't it? Where's Andy? <sighs> Andy! Andy took a nail, too. He took a nail. Uh, Rick took a nail. We, everyone was taking a nail when we were building this thing out. We were really trying to be Christ-like, but we, we, uh, we have a different perspective. Now, I say all that because I asked you to look in Philippians. In, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, we must hold on to the progress we've already made. And so, we, we, like Life Without Limits is celebrating an anniversary and, and what's happened and when, it ha and when it started and all the things that have happened. And then with us, we're almost seven years in and all these things have happened. And the Bible does say, Paul tells us in Philippians 3.16, to hold on to the progress that we've already made. So there is a sense that we should reflect on these things and celebrate what God has done. And, and we should celebrate the progress that's already been made. Individually in our walk, too, right? Has God ever done anything for you? Yes. Anybody? Yes. And someone could testify, right? So, so we should celebrate those things. And, and, and the reason we celebrate those things is because it helps us, when we're remembering past progress, it helps us in our current crisis. You see, when we're, when we're faced with the mountain, we can reflect back on the times when he delivered us when the mountain was in front of us. When, 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 when we were broke, I, I told the story last night, I told it before in the search, but, but years ago when I was selling cars, I remember one day that as a salesman, like you gotta have a phone, right? You need some clients. So I was so broke that I couldn't even pay my cell phone bill. And so I, I was so, I didn't know what to do with myself. I had, I had exerted all of myself to try to get something accomplished and it wasn't working. Anyone ever been there? And so I, I found myself behind the dealership, behind the cars that are getting detailed. That's the back of the dealership. And I'm down there on the ground and I'm weeping and I'm like, Lord, I am so broken. Like, I can't fix this. I have no money. I can't, I can't feed my family. I can't even keep my cell phone on just in the event maybe someone would call me so I could sell something. Please help me. 20 minutes later, my phone rings, and it's my buddy Billy from Orlando. He says, what are you doing today? And I'm like, you know, downtrodden. I'm like, I'm just here at work, you know, just trying to sell something. He's like, well, if you can, if you can get in your car and come out to my office in Lake Mary, me and my associates don't think you should be broke. We have a check for $800 for you. Like, come on, dude. Right? It's not about money. It's about God. It's about the provider. It's the one who listens and loves and provides. That's who he is. And so it's great to reflect on that because there could come a day and there will come a day that I'm going to be there again. Where I just need, I'm, I need to be utterly dependent upon him, but I need to be able to look back and reflect on what he's done so I can be encouraged right now in what he will do. We have to. So we have to look back and reflect individually, but corporately for sure. Individually, he's come through for you, I'm sure, in many ways and many times. But corporately, for sure, we should be reflecting. See, Philippians was written to a local church, a gathering of believers just like this right here in this room in, in modern-day Turkey. So if the Mediterranean Sea is here and Israel's right here, here's the, here's the sea above north of the Mediterranean Sea, which is modern-day Turkey, that's where Philippi was. And, and Paul 
had written this letter to that group of people. So, that being said, before Paul tells us to hold on to the progress we've already made, he says something before that. And I want you to look at what he says in verse 10. He says this, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. He, 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 wants to, he wants to have things that he can look back on. He wants to experience this stuff, right? He wants an authentic experience concerning Christ. Not some phony facade, not some phony religious activity. No, he wants way more than to know about Jesus, and he wants to know more than just old Bible stories about Noah and Abraham and sing little vacation Bible school songs. He wants real. He wants emotions engaged. He wants power experienced. He wants the good. He wants the bad. He wants everything. I want to experience you, Christ. That's what he wants. Now he's speaking to us individually, but he's speaking to us corporately in this letter. So he wants, we should all want to experience God. We should all want to know him personally. We all want to experience his power. We want to experience that resurrection power from death to life when you, you're, you're, you're helpless and he delivers you. Like that day when I got that phone call. I want to experience that. I want to know that he's real, man. I don't want him to just be a, a God of a book. I want, to know, I want this book to come alive. I want to experience. When people say, how do you know Jesus is real? I say, because of this. And I tell them time after time. We could sit here. I could, I could throw this thing out and tell you all the stories, man. And it'll blow your brains out of the things he's done in my life. Amen. Crazy stuff. I want to experience all that. But he also wants us to experience it as a church, as a group of people. He wants you to experience it all, all. There was a song, when this church first, I'm not even talking about this church, so I'm talking about when we planted like 10 years ago. Man, I used to get up and sing. It was, yeah. It was, it, man, it was bad. But there was a song a couple years back that kind of says what I'm talking about. It was from Mercy Me. I think we got some of the words up here. If you if you'd advance that a little bit, yes, I, I don't know. I remind. I mean, I remember him back to to when we used to do it, you know, and and I love that song, and uh, I mean, I I don't know. I don't think I should sing it though, but no, 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 no. no. Can I just no? Yeah. Well, you, well, you really? You come do a duet with me, sweetheart. Come on. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> do you know this song? No. You don't know this song. I don't know. I don't know this song. You're here. here. Okay, bring me joy. Bring me peace. Bring the chance to be free. Bring me anything that brings you glory and i know there'll be days when this life brings me pain but if that's what it takes to praise you jesus bring the rain <laughs> did you guys sing with me i don't think you sang it loud enough I think we should sing it again, right? Because I want to hear it from down deep in your soul, man. Hey, why don't you all stand up for a second? Let's have some fun. You guys want, let's sing this thing together, man. Let's sing, this is, and the rain, it's raining outside, man. It's perfect. This is a perfect storm. Bring me joy, bring me peace, bring the chance to be free. Bring me anything that brings you glory. And I know there'll be days when this life brings me pain. But if that's what it takes to praise you, Jesus, bring the rain. Woo! Yeah. Awesome. See, Paul wanted it all. 
He didn't just want all the fluffy, happy times, right? He wanted it all. He realized that the best place to view a mountaintop was down in the valley. Amen. But sometimes we're up, we want to be up on the mountain all the time, which is great. But remember, when you're up on the mountain, what are you looking at? Down in the valley where your problem was. Maybe that's not the best perspective. Maybe the best perspective is down in the valley so you can look at the mountaintop. You know, wherever, you, wherever, you, uh, wherever your eyes go is where your body flows. Yeah. Do you know that, right? So, so we need to keep our eye on the prize. We, needed, we need a little bit of a, the good. We need a little bit of the bad. We don't want to just have mountaintop experience. We want, listen, I want it all. I want everything that God would bring into my life, and I want to receive it with joy. That's it. So let's get a little perspective on what Paul's talking about here. See, Philippians was written after. So, so Paul, he, he goes to Philippi, and he, and he, and he and he meets some people, and they get saved, and he plants a church. And, he, and, the, and the Bible will tell you what Paul would do. He would go, and he'd start a church, and he'd appoint some leaders, and he would work with them, get them established, right, get it rocking, and then he would move on to the next city and replicate and do it again. Okay, and so we, what we see is in Acts chapter 9, that's when we meet what his name was Saul, but Paul. We meet Paul in Acts chapter 9, and then there's a few more chapters, and we see some of the things that go on in his life. And in Acts chapter 16, that's when he actually gets to Philippi, and he meets the people, and he plants the church. So let's see. Paul said to these people that he'd written, he had planted the church, moved on, and wrote back to them. Let's just see if during that time, between Acts 9 and Acts 16, let's just see if he experienced Christ's power. Let's just see if he experienced Christ's suffering. Let's just see if Paul got to know Christ, okay? I want, to see, I want you to guys get involved here with me again. Let me, hold up your left hand, your left hand, just your left hand. This is your thumbs up hand. Can you guys do this? Okay? And, and your right hand is your, is your thumbs down hand, right? Thumbs down, right. Some of you don't know the difference, okay? Awesome, awesome. Right is down, left is up. So what I'm going to do, because Jesus, bring the rain. Whatever it takes to praise you, bring the rain, right? And that's what Paul wanted. I want to experience it all, Lord. And so I want to kind of walk through real quickly through Acts chapter 9 through 16. Let's just see if, God, if, if Paul experienced Jesus the way he says he wants to. And when I, when I tell you something, it's either a good thing, and I want to see your left hand up, or it's a bad thing, I want to see your right hand up but facing down. Can you do that? All right, you're ready. Okay, so in Acts chapter 9, when we first meet Paul, it says that he's walking along, he's getting ready to go persecute the church. He was Jewish, and he didn't think that Jesus was the real deal, and he wanted to, to kill and imprison and stop all of you. And so he's gone his way there, and all of a sudden, a light comes down from heaven, and a voice, and it says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is that good? Yeah. Oh, no. Wait, whoa, wait. Hold on a second. So you're trying to tell me that if you're going along your day and, and, and that happens and, say, and he calls you up and says, hey, God, like you'd be happy about that? How about if he, stroke, if he struck you blind on the spot? Right? Now, now listen. He said, I want to know Jesus. He heard his voice. Like, I, I, I do this all the time. Like I said, I've done it 300 and something times. And I'm getting to know the Lord, praise the Lord, through his word mostly. But I, know, I don't hear audible voices. I don't have light, you know, spotlights coming down on me and knocking me on my key, sir, and going, yo, dude, why are you persecuting me? Why are you messing up, man? I don't get that. Paul heard the voice, saw the light, knocked him on his fanny. Do you think he's getting to know Jesus a little bit in there? Yeah, big time, right? Struck blind, bad. But then God sends Ananias to go to Paul, lay hands on him, pray, and now he's, he can see. He's experiencing Jesus. He's experiencing the power he said he wanted to experience, the resurrecting power that raised Christ from the dead. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I used to be blind, but now I see. And he's experiencing the power of Jesus right then and there. So we got, we got this, we got this, right? Wait, this and this, okay. How about this? Acts 13. After he's blinded, and now he can see, in Acts 13, Paul is used by God to facilitate divine blindness 
on Bar Jesus the sorcerer. Awesome power, right? Anyone? Anyone? Up or down? No opinion, y'all? Yes, that's powerful, right? He gets to know the power of Jesus. In the same chapter, this is for the preacher. This is a gift for me. It said, when he went to Pisidia, the entire city came to church. Woo! Imagine, stop for a second, man. You got to have some vision, right? What if the entire city of Leesburg showed up next week? Come on, dude. Dude, that would be thumbs up and woo! Everything. That was totally dorky right there. Yes. Dorky for Jesus. I don't even care. So, so, so the whole city shows up for church. That's awesome, right? And then the same story. It says that not only did everybody show up, but a bunch of people got saved. Come on. Power, right? Including the governor of the city. Like, that was awesome, right? So that's a massive influence and power. Resurrection power. Acts 14. He heals a crippled man. Power, right? Someone said, look at your neighbor. Say, that's powerful. That, that, that wasn't powerful the way y'all said it, but, but that was powerful. Acts 16, right? In Acts 16, when, this, when, he, when he goes to Philippi, he meets three people, the Bible says, and the second person was this lady who was working for a sorcerer, and she was a fortune teller, and she was going around telling fortunes, which is not godly. And so Paul casts the demon out of her. And so what happens is, because of this, her boss gets ticked off because this chick's not making money for him anymore. And so that guy grabs his buddies, and they're like, hey, let's do something about this. And so they call the, the authorities of that city. They arrest Paul and his boys. And look, anyone give a whooping when they were little? What'd you get? Switch? Piece of kindling. Piece of kindling, yeah. Whatever Cindy could get her hands on. Just start whipping it right across the house. You know, those things that we spank our kids with, like we use a spoon. I'm not ashamed. We use a wooden spoon. That's what we use. And, and, and those things that we use to, to whip the, the hiney of our kid are meant to, to just be skin deep. Just to leave a little red mark, just a reminder, because it's good to give them a little pain so they can avoid big pain, right? It's good to, to trip them up a little bit and have them skin a knee then fall off a cliff. So that's why we spank our kids, right? And it's only just supposed to hurt skin deep. Just a, a little reminder, hey, toe the line, youngster, right? But, but see, Paul, when he got arrested, he got beaten with a, with a wooden rod, you know, this, this would hurt your bones, you see? That would hurt beyond, beyond your, your, your skin deep thing, right? And so it's said that the, he got arrested and beaten, the Bible says he was beaten severely with a wooden rod. And then he was put in jail. And I'm not talking right here in Lake County where there's air conditioning and food that sucks, but it's food. I'm talking carved into the side of a rock with rats and feces, and then put in stocks, right? Real bad, having a bad day. But you know what? Even in that, Jesus bring the rain. And so you know what happens? He's in the prison cell, and him and his buddy, they start praying and singing. Can you feel the volume going up? Come on now. I feel like singing that song again, man, you know? They start singing, and they start singing, Jesus, bring the rain, right? And, and all of a sudden, there's an earthquake. Go either way. Earthquake comes, that could scare the daylights out of you, right? You get hurt, that could be bad. But not this earthquake. See, this earthquake shook the jail and burst the doors open and set him free. See, see, so instead of, but here's the, here's the awesome thing. Thumbs up, anybody on that one? Right, that's awesome, right? But here's the amazing thing about, about Paul is that sometimes when things are tough, we want to run. And if we're given an escape route, we want to run. When, when the pressure's on, when the marriage is tough, when the job is tough, right, we want to run. And Paul, he sings, and there's an earthquake, and the doors open up. So if you're in jail, and you've been unjustly accused of something, and unjustly put in jail, and the doors open, what would you do? Run! Right? But he didn't.
And the prison guard looks and sees the door open. And in Rome, if you lose your prisoner, they'll take a sword and put it through your guts. You lost your what? Death. So instead of the gruesome, horrible death that he would experience at the hands of Rome, he goes to try to kill himself and Paul's in his cell still and goes, wait, we're still here. That makes me want to cry. Like, I don't even understand that. Who would do that? Who would do that? Paul would because he wants to experience all of it. Bring me peace. Bring the chance to be free. Right? Bring the chance to be free. He did. But bring me anything that will bring you glory. Right? And so he says, stay. And the prison guard stops and says, whoa, 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 you're still here? And Paul leads him to the Lord. Right? Come on. And then he goes home and leads the whole family says yes to Jesus. Dude, come on. He wants to experience all of it. All of it. What Paul went through was, I don't, I'm trying to think of the word that I could use. I, astonishing? Like, insane? Crazy? Right? Beaten, put in jail, sings songs, God answers, opens doors, saves a whole family. Like, I don't even, I've had some good days in ministry, none like that. I'm totally, if I could lead a whole family to Christ tonight, dude, come on. I don't know about the beating part, but I have to be, listen, I say that and it's funny, but don't you need to be willing? I know there's some tough guys in here. I know some, some tough ladies in here. Would you be willing to take a nail for somebody? Would you take a beating? Would you, bring, would you have whatever it took to bring him glory? So I'm talking to the church now. What's it going to take? What will you do to see God glorified in this city? What would you do? I know what Paul would do. What he went through was amazing. That's a perspective none of us have. But here's the thing that blew my brain. That blew my brain, but this, explo- this nuked my brain. What, what Paul said about these experiences, that nuked my brain. Look what he says in verse, look at verse 12. I don't, <laughs> he said, well, first, let me repeat this. I want to know Christ. I want to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him. I want to share in his death so I can experience this power of the resurrection from the dead. And I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things. Really? This letter was written after what I just told you about. This was after all that stuff happened. He'd been through all that stuff, and he says, I haven't yet achieved knowing Christ. I haven't yet achieved experiencing Christ's power. I haven't yet achieved sharing Christ's suffering. Well, we can all clearly see that he had, right? You just, you just, you just saw it laid right before you. I try to say it with some clarity. You, you saw it. You thumbed up and down. You saw what he went through, right? But he says, I haven't yet gone through this. That's confusing to me. And maybe it's confusing to you. I don't know, but this might help. There's a verse in scripture that's extremely weird and it makes people kind of freak out, but I think it helps. Let me read it to you. Luke 14, 26, it says this. Jesus is speaking and he says, and I think this will help us have clarity on this whole, I have not achieved these things yet that he obviously had. Luke 14, 26 says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. As a Christian, just hearing those words makes me cringe because that's not the Jesus that I know, right? That's not the loving Christ that I know that would tell me if I'm going to follow him, I have to hate Meredith. I have to hate Adriana. I have to hate my mom. Does that make any sense? Like, 
What do you do with that? What do you do with the, with, with the words of Paul in, 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 I mean, I'm sorry, the words of Jesus when he's asked about the great com- commandment and he says to love your neighbor as yourself? Well, my neighbor is my mother-in-law. Am I supposed to hate her to be a disciple? I mean, I'm just saying that's what it says, right? That's what it says. What about Ephesians 5.25 that says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. And forget the particulars, but how about this blanket statement that we see in Scripture in John 13.34 where Jesus says, to love one another just as I have loved you. So how are we going to pull off both? How are we supposed to love everybody, but yet he's telling us that to truly be his follower, we're supposed to hate them? How are we going to pull that off? Unless, see, unless it means don't hate them, but hate them compared to how you love me. And see, if you don't take time to study God's word, you wouldn't know that. You'd see Jesus telling you, Stacy, if you're going to follow me, you have to hate Michael. <laughs> I went to seminary and I want to show off a little bit. So the Greek word is meseo. Hate meaning to love less. To love less. Jesus never said to hate your mom, to hate your brother. Of course he would never say that. But translations will tell us that that's what he said. And so you got to dig. It means if you want to be my disciple, you need to love those people less than you love me. Jesus Christ, number one. Number one. And so maybe that helps us with our Philippians text where he says, I have not yet achieved these things. But yet we see that he did. And so maybe what he's saying here is, I have not yet achieved Christ's power and I have not yet achieved Christ's suffering and I have not yet achieved this this ability to know Christ at all compared to what I will. Right? Someone other than Jessica, right, come on. We're talking about the church here. We're talking about experiencing Christ and his power as a, as a, as a gathering. And Paul's like, I have experienced all these things, but, but nothing compared to what I will. So, so it's okay to hold on to progress, and it's okay to celebrate the past and to, and to, to, to look back at our past victories and all, but that's not what we're supposed to do. We're not supposed to look back on the glory days of the church when all these people got baptized and all these people came to the altar and got saved and, and, and we had all these awesome events where we reached out. Like Those things are great. And when we, I remember weeks when we couldn't pay the, 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 the rent here or the electric bill and so my wife and I would forego our mortgage payment to so, make sure they kept going. Like I remember those days and so it's good to see that now through all that he has provided and here we are. Like, that's awesome. It's good to remind ourselves of these things. But that's not what we're supposed to stay. We shouldn't stay there. We're talking about some vision here. He says this. I've not yet achieved these things. Or that I've already reached perfection. So I'm not all that I should be. The church is not all that it should be yet. But I press on to, pers- to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. See, he has, he has in his mind this, this end result for each and every one of you, and he has this, this end result for the church. In the beginning of the book of Philippians, Paul is talking to the church, and he's talking about how they shared in the work of the ministry, and he's convinced that the one who began a good work in us See, most of us take it as personal. The one who began the good work in you, Tyler, will continue to do so. He was writing to the church and how they were the partner of his to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And he says, the one who began a good work in you, he was talking to a church, will continue to do so until the day of Christ Jesus. And, and, And we know that that's real because we're sitting here right now. That's why. Because the gospel got to Leesburg. Because of what Paul did in Philippi and Ephesus and Colossae. And it's now here. 2,000 years later, thousands of miles from there, it's here right now. 
So the, the work that he began in them has continued until the day of Christ Jesus. And so he says, I haven't quite got there yet. I know what your plan is for me and for us. I haven't got there, but I press on to get that. He says, no, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. If you've had an experience in your life, whether it's good or bad, it's impossible to just go, you know what? I'm just going to forget about that. You, you might not dwell on it, but it's hard to just turn your brain off. We're made that way to, with memory. Unless you're a man, and we don't remember anything, right, ladies? But... <laughs> Again, don't let the wording fool you. It's not that we just forget it, but we forget it compared to. He says, I, I, it's good to go back and dwell on those things and remember those things and recall those past deliverances because it helps in our current crisis. But he says, we don't focus on those things in the past. Those are good. God was good back in the day, right? It was good. He delivered me. He, he blessed me when I was in time of need. He came through for me. Praise the Lord. But we don't focus on that. What do we do? We focus on what lies ahead. And you need to be focused. The Christians, the posture of their heart, their eyes, their thoughts shouldn't be on what God used to do in our church. Even last week, we can rejoice that Kim got baptized, but we should be expecting who's going to get baptized more in the future. That's the church of Jesus Christ that's just like that guy, pressing forward to achieve that which God wants for us. Like, never satisfied with, I don't care if there was 50,000 people in here and we were experiencing thousands of salvations and baptisms every single year. Strive for more. The Bible says that a king's glory is a growing population. There's seven billion people on this earth, and his word says it is his desire that all are saved. Church is about numbers. He wants everyone to worship him. And it's your job and my job to go get them. That's our job. And we should be striving to the ends of the earth and never satisfied until there's 14 billion hands lifted to heaven, screaming at the top of their lungs, Jesus is Lord. That's what we should be striving for all the time, all the time. We look forward, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. We've all experienced the Lord. We've all experienced the Lord in the past. But what Paul's saying here, and you should be saying is, yeah, I've experienced the Lord, but it's nothing compared to what I'm gonna experience. Paul had been planting churches, whipped and beaten and put in jail and singing songs and the doors open up and he's leading people to Christ. I mean, amazing stuff. And he's like, yeah, that's nothing. How many people in this room can, can say they've done what Paul has done? No one. And he's like, I did all this stuff? That's nothing compared to what God's going to do through my life in the future. And we should all be feeling that way. Every one of us. The best is yet to come. The, the, it's not the good old days. We don't, re, we don't re, we have to be dwelling on the good old days. What about the days ahead? That's what we should be thinking about all the time. You ain't seen nothing yet, Paul's saying. You wait to see what's going to happen through my life. I know who's, who I am. I know who, to whom I am owned. I know whose spirit lives inside of me, and I know the job that he's given me. You watch and see what's going to happen in my life. And maybe you've learned some stuff from the Lord over the years. But you should be expecting, you know what, I'm going to be given more wisdom and more understanding and I'm going to have more truth so I can be more effective for the kingdom of God. And maybe he's come through for you in times of, of, of extreme need and lack and you poured out your guts and he came through for you. But you should be expecting that he'll do even greater things in your life in the future. And maybe he's used you in ministry in a variety of different ways, here and there, here and there. But you should be expecting that God's going to use you for great things to advance his kingdom. Every single one of you. 
Every one of you, if you're a Christ follower, if you bent the knee to Jesus, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. He gave you a gift to build his church. Now you got to go do it. And you could do great things. You could do great things if you'd let him use you. In this letter, I'm up here hollering about, you know, you, definitely. But again, this letter was written to a church. So let's just talk about it in the context of a church. I've seen amazing things happen here at this church. Ever since way back when, we used to pull the little garden tub out of the back of the building and someone said, I want to get baptized. And I'd yell at Austin and Grayson and them and I'd say, go fill the tank. And they'd drag the old fiberglass tank out from behind the building and they'd put a hose in it. And, we'd, and I'd say, all right, let's go. We, as soon as they got done, they'd say, all right, it's full. Like it was just the way we were. And, 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 and we'd just go outside. It was dark out. We'd get tore up by mosquitoes. We didn't care, right? And, and we'd be dunking people in this old garden tub. I mean, it was just amazing. You know, I, we've, had the opp- we've had the privilege in, in our church. We, we've baptized like well over 300 people in this church. Like, it's awesome. And we should rejoice. But we should be looking forward to 600. We should be looking forward to 1,200. We should be looking forward to, to, to 3,000. You know that the Lord added 3,000 people one day back there in the book of Acts? I just got a question for you guys. Maybe you could help me out. Is Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? Yeah. And doesn't he want every single person to understand the truth and be saved? Yeah. So why wouldn't he save 3,000 today? Yep. Amen. See, we cap him. We don't think that that could happen in the church. We look back and go, wow, it's incredible that 300 people got saved and baptized. But we can't be looking in the rearview mirror because then we can't be looking out front. We're going to be looking out front going, but, 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 but we want more, Lord. We want you to come and do crazy stuff in our church. We, want, we would love to see the whole city of Leesburg. Like, people might think you're insane. I'm saying this right now. Some might think I'm totally insane, right? But why wouldn't you expect that the whole city would come to church? Is that far-fetched? It's not. And I believe, and I know my brother Robert believes, that if we would come to this church, those that are already here, and we would come and we would pray our guts out. And we would serve with everything we had. And we were generous like beyond crazy. God would do stuff like that. Because the eyes of the Lord go back and forth across the earth looking to strengthen those whose hearts are completely his. You want more people coming here to serve with you? Start serving. You want people to come generous givers? Start being generous. You want these seats filled? With more people that haven't been here yet, make sure you put your hiney in a seat every weekend. Leave, it got quiet up in here, didn't it? <laughs> Stepping on some toes. <clears throat> Seen amazing things happen here in this church. Great events. Pastors coming together, praying. People getting saved, people getting baptized. We had great evangelistic events. We've had... Good Friday together, that was incredible. Seven, eight churches come together. A thousand people at the baseball stadium up there in Leesburg sharing the good news of Jesus' resurrection. It was incredible. All the bands were all together, kind of just this super band. Everyone was playing worship songs. Sun goes down. The name Jesus lit, and lit up under the lights. Man, it was just awesome. Like great things have happened in our church. It's been, tr- it's been tremendous. But we can't dwell on those things. We gotta be thinking, you know what, those are good things, but maybe God wants to bring us greater evangelistic opportunities. Maybe God wants to see more people serving and, and greater levels of service and, and more people giving and greater levels of giving and greater relationships in the church with, between us and God and with each other. My best friends are here. You're my best friends. And, and I want more friends in my life. I want more people that I can love and love me. And this is, we should be striving for those types of things and pour into the people that you go to church with. 
Have you ever thought about maybe our church would be, would be more effective in, in supporting missionaries to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth? Maybe we would send some missionaries to the ends of the earth. Maybe there's some people in this church. Maybe there's a young man in this church right now that feels him, it's swelling up inside of him and he gets lifted up and he rises up and he, and he has this passion inside of him to share the gospel to the ends of the earth and we come around that young man and give him some resources and give him some people and a new church is birthed out of revolution in a city that doesn't have a, a gospel work yet. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about something beyond this church that we're in right now? I do. It's what keeps me up at night. It's what wakes me up at night. It's what gets me up in the morning. This right here. This is what I'm talking about. This. And if God wants all people saved, wouldn't he want this to happen? Wouldn't he want us to be thinking this way all the time? I think so. I think so. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, we do what Paul says. We look forward to what lies ahead. When you're driving down the road, you know what happens. When you're driving and something catches your attention, you start looking at it, what happens? So let's drift forward. You keep your eyes on the prize. He says here, look forward looking forward to what lies ahead, to press on. The NLT would say to press on. The King James would say press toward. New American Standard, press on toward, to keep pursuing. Another fancy word, another Greek word, dioko. It's to pursue. It's, it's, it's what we're, and that should be the Christian, and that should be the church, corporately. We're, we're pursuing something. We're not just existing. We're not just here. But there's a reason why we're here. We're pursuing the kingdom of God. We're pursuing the Lord Jesus. We're pursuing the lost. That's what we should be doing. Our, the posture of our ministry should be like the guy on the screen. That's us always pressing forward. At the end of the race, when your legs are cramped and you feel like you have nothing left. Anyone ever been there? The runner, what does he do? He leans forward, he strives, gives it all that he has to try to win the race. That's the posture of, that Revolution Church should be all the time. Everything you have for his kingdom's cause. Everything. Your time. I'm not going to go down the list. You know it. Everything. We press forward. Can I get the worship band back up here? I, wanna, I feel like singing some more, man. I feel like singing. Listen, the, the, the runner at the end of the race, he runs with everything he has, right? A, a, a real runner that wants to win doesn't give it all at the beginning and nothing at the end. The one who wants to win saves it for the end and just gives it everything they have. That's what this church needs to do. To exert yourself, to do your best, your greatest effort to strive, to fight vigorously, to do all that you could do, to pull out all the stops, to give it your utmost. That's what God wants for this church. And so I just kind of want to leave you with this. How many people, I asked you earlier, how many people in this room have had dire need in a pinch that they felt like they were completely at the end and they poured their guts out to Jesus and he came through? How many? Keep your hand up because now you're, you're showing him that you're worshiping him and, and, and you're surrendering. Look, let's surrender, right? Let's just surrender. So, so you think back when I asked you that question, you think back, just, just close your eyes for a second. You think back to that thing. And all of us, if we, if, if we could go up and down the roads with a microphone, you'd tell us a different story of what it was and how he came through. And it's always out of left field and you're like, wow, Lord, but you did it. And it's good to reflect back on those things, right? Because it gives us hope in the future that he's going to be a, a God that will deliver again. That he's not just the God of yesterday, but he's the God of today and he's the God of tomorrow. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so in our own life, personally, we want him to do these crazy things like he did before. Well, I want you to do it again, Lord. I want you to do it again. And then as a church, let, let's reflect back on the, the, the glorious things that have happened in the past. 
all the, the beautiful musicians that have come and gone through this church and gone elsewhere and are active in ministries elsewhere, sharing the love of God and letting their voices be used so the Lord can sing over his people. Awesome. New churches came out of this church. Awesome. People that have blessed this ministry with their resources, with their time, with their money, with their efforts, up all night working, praying, serving, giving, helping, crying. And God, you've done, you've done some amazing things here in our church. And we thank you for all those things, but Lord, we want to do like Paul said. You, you, you inspired him to write this because that's the way you want us to be as a church. Not, not just to, to forget those things in the past, but to reflect, to hold on to what we've already accomplished. But to focus on what lies ahead. Lord, whatever it is that you did before, Lord, we want you to do it again. And we want you to do it even bigger. And we want you to do it even better. And Lord, we plead with you that you would look down at this church and find hearts that are completely yours. And that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour a blessing down on our church and give us the privilege of being used for your kingdom in crazy ways, even more than we were used before. Even more than when you gave us our billboard and we got to share the gospel with 250 million people across the earth through various media avenues. But Lord, we want more than that. We want, we want millions and millions, if not, we want everybody to know about your grace and your love and your power and your Jesus. We want to be that church, Lord. You've done some incredible things through some churches across the earth. And that's all we're asking here, Lord, is that you do it again right here. Do it here. Do it again. Do it again. Be awesome, God. And use us for your kingdom's cause. And now, Lord, we bless you with our voices. Help us to sing with everything we have. In Jesus' name. But you have never failed me yet 